Today on the Video Maker Podcast, we talk about green screen, or rather chroma key. We talk about how to do it right and whether or not you should actually do it at all. All that and more coming up. But first, I want to quickly make you aware of Video Maker's email newsletter. It's full of great Video Maker articles covering the art and technology of video production. You'll find how-to articles, articles that cover the concepts and principles of visual storytelling, reviews of the latest video cameras and software, a roundup of the latest video news, buyer's guides that cover everything from camera support, computers, field monitors, and tons more. Plus, if you want to get alerts about our free instructional webinars and receive invitations to our in-person networking events across the United States, the VideoMaker email newsletter is the best way to stay up to speed. Sign up today at videomaker.com slash newsletter. That's videomaker.com slash newsletter. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Video Maker Podcast. I'm Mike Wilhelm. With me, as always, to my right is Nicole Lajeunesse. Hello. And to my left is Chris Monlux. And today, uh, just a quick, couple quick announcements. As always, if you've been listening to this podcast and you like it, we would love it if you went over to iTunes. I keep calling it iTunes, even though it's not called that anymore. It's Apple Podcasts now. Go over to that thing and give us a five-star review. Um, and while you're there, hit the subscribe button. It'll deliver the podcast straight to your device um, every week. Um, secondly, we have um, a, an, an uh, issue of Creator Handbook coming out soon. So it comes out uh, not this coming Monday or not the day that this releases, but next Monday, the 2nd. So you can get that issue by going to creatorhandbook.net slash enews, and it's free. So if you are a content creator for YouTube or Twitch, you should absolutely sign up for that. There's lots of good stuff in there, which comes out uh, right now quarterly um, as a digital magazine or creatorhandbook.net kind of all the time. And we talk a little bit, not a whole lot, about podcasting in there. Uh, yeah, that's so, right. Uh, yeah, we talk about all kinds of stuff. All sorts of stuff. So it's not just uh, Twitch or YouTube, but, uh, you know, online content creation. Yeah, and sharing on social media and, and how to monetize and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, so the podcast especially applies if you're doing like what we're doing of releasing a YouTube version, right? Yep. <laughs> or doing it live. A lot of people do that. Um, okay, so today's topic is green screen, and um, I didn't think this would be controversial, but apparently it is. Chris is not a fan of green screen. He's <laughs> no. gonna he's gonna argue uh, why you know we should never use it and why humanity is worse off because we have it. And all right, that I might not screen. go that far, but uh, <laughs> I can't say I don't like it <laughs> most of the time. Um, but before we get into that, you know, um, controversial nature of the topic, I figure we should probably start with talking about like, what is green screen and how does it work and how should you do it right? So maybe, um, Nicole, why don't, why don't you start us off? Uh, okay. So green screen, uh, you are all probably familiar with it by seeing any like major blockbuster uses green screen in some capacity. It's basically a way to replace the background or even sometimes objects with something else using the power of chroma key which is a, a method by which you can remove a specific color out of a frame and then replace it with whatever you want, basically. And it can be, it, it can be sometimes it's background, sometimes it's other things. It's just replace something with something else, but that you just pretty much are matting it out. Yeah, it's like <clears throat> the simplest version, I guess, is one person in front of a green screen and then you remove all of that green and put them on Mars or in the jungle or wherever you want them to be. Yeah, so the basic of the technology, right, is kind of what you said of you're taking a color and you're replacing it with something else. Um, we often think of colors in digital imaging as three colors, red, green, blue. But there's actually, it's not a color. Those are channels, <laughs> red channel, green channel, blue channel. There's four channels, which is red channel, green channel, blue channel, and the uh, opacity channel, I guess. Um, which is the alpha channel. And in this case, we're saying identify this color and replace it with alpha. So clear, make this clear. Um, and uh, that's what allows you to layer uh, images on top of one another to create an illusion that you're seeing through one color to the next. Um, but really this is um, it's slightly technical on the computer side of just identifying the, the green uh, or whatever color you're working with. 
But and that is a discipline in itself. But the real thing that I think that most people struggle with more than anything, um, correct me if I'm wrong, if you guys think otherwise, is is lighting, right? Like yeah. lighting is really the key to effective chroma key. Yeah, I think a lot of people do get like get their green screen footage, set up their green screen, get their green screen footage, and then take it into their editor and try to make it work. And once you're at that point where you're in your um, in your timeline already or in your whatever effects program it's like going to be a lot harder if you didn't do it right on the shooting side of things so yeah. you can mess with all the sliders you want and figure out what they do and whatever but if you want it to really look professional you have to plan it from the very beginning yeah i have a good story about this so I used to make commercials and um, we were making ads for a car dealership and uh, they weren't very easy to work with they weren't available a lot of times so um, the salesman on a whim in front of the client said, why don't we just green screen you uh, doing a couple things so that we can just continue to make ads. Totally a good idea. I mean, that would have been good if we were prepared for it. And all we had was a green screen in our car that I think we just happened to have in there. We didn't even like plan to have it in the van, but we had it. And so like we were holding up the sheet and they, we couldn't go inside because cars and people were doing work. They wanted to do it outside, and we had no other lights and stuff. And they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. And I'm like, now you've sold this client. that You're going to make them a couple more ads on us not being prepared for actually making it. And uh, we didn't end up using any of the stuff they did. But uh, And uh, we, I think we used one frame, which was a guy, in a, strangely enough, in a frog costume. <laughs> and he was green okay. in front of a green screen. I mean, so you're like adding more and more stupidity on top of this, uh, which was really just, and a, just a, difficulty and, and yeah, what but, a nightmare. To but the biggest by. thing was like we we I mean, we honestly, because it was a, the city that was in was an hour and a half away. We wanted this to work. I mean, it's a great idea if they would have told us about it beforehand and we would have actually lit it properly and found a proper place to do it. And of course, written a script and all the other parts of it. But that really the biggest thing we tried doing it was like, no, the the lighting just didn't give us enough. The, there was so n much light that it was splashing onto the person talking. Now this is separate from someone dressed up as a frog because they have rebates. Get it? Rebates? Oh, yeah. I just remembered that was the that was the reason. Why. Uh, <laughs> rebate, rebate. That was that was a little guy jumping. Oh in. my we, gosh, that is that is classic. You know, uh, local low TV. budget commercial. Oh, totally. And and uh, yeah. and what we ended up doing is just taking a steel frame, cutting it out in Photoshop. And then animating him, so making all of his ankles and everything else move so he could jump like a frog. So, you, so we made him jump like a frog. We did what we said we were going to do, but it was just a still frame. That you we ended up so not using chroma him. key at all. You rotoscoped no. it out or whatever? Yeah, we just we just, we just masked it out. Okay, so yeah. I think I, I, I see what's going on here. You know um, how people who are afraid of dogs, it's usually rooted in um, a traumatic experience they had uh, as a young person with a dog. Yeah. That's Chris with green screen. He had this, he had this, uh, this frog shoot, and uh, from then on, I, I'd actually say though, so like terrible. every time anybody offered saying green screen was the solution, they didn't know what they were talking about, and it was a lazy way of trying to get something that they could have gotten otherwise. So yeah. that's that was that's my biggest gripe about it. We'll talk about that after the break. But yeah, so that's maybe, really my biggest thing wanna, is using it when it's necessary is the biggest key to making it successful. Well, I want to go into why, like, this is a good learning experience, I think. Why, what are all the factors that made that so terrible and not work at all? It's like, first, like, understanding how green screen works. Your, pro your program, when you bring it in, is looking for anything that's green and you can adjust the tolerance so it's like but like a specific green so the tolerance is spreading it out to yeah, going different and, shades of that green yeah yeah so so y you can have a range of hues but the more narrow that range is the better it's gonna look yeah so in this case we were we were dealing with not only was the green screen not evenly lit because even is about the 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 biggest point of trying to light your green screen is the more shadows and gradient of light you have on the green screen the more gradient there is in that green yeah, right. the more you have to yeah. widen out the tolerance exactly yeah. and so we had that issue and so we you know just dealing with lighting there and then the other part of that is lighting your subjects so they're separate from the green screen so that you can actually when you pull that green you're not pulling anything out of them so you don't want them to have any green on them and that is starting off with uh, don't wear green yeah um but also don't let green reflect onto your subject and so yeah. one way to do that is to control your lighting and make sure there's not 
unnecessary spill. Yeah, this is a really, really difficult thing to see in real time. Yeah. Uh, this idea that green will spill. If someone's standing in front spill of a green screen. Spill is the key word. You know, you can imagine it a lot like, you know, I'm, I don't know if anyone has had this experience where you have something like a balloon, like a bright red balloon in a room and some light hits it and then suddenly red is sort of falling on everything. You got this mm-hmm. red tint in the room. Mm-hmm. The same thing happens with green. All this light lands on the green and then the green kind of reflects and paints thing other things that are around it in more green yeah Yeah. so when you go back into your editor and you're trying to adjust your tolerance so it's picking up all of the green screen you might also pick up some of the spill on your subject and then that subject all of that area will be fuzzy fuzz out or yeah, yeah, or or it'll be translucent like it. or whatever of of pulling. You'll lose the key. some of your subjects yeah, and, into the green screen, which will just look really weird. And I've had that play out well. Like um, you can thin someone because it pretty much will pull the 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 spill. And if it's a clean line, it, it works can, great for bald people. They look it look normal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what uh, here's what I've had really difficulties with in these situations is um, skinny, uh, big haired women. Uh, and the reason why is the the hair. There's just you know there's a lot of translucence in your hair that is going through, and the the skinny was just that they um, when they animated or they were talking with their hands or other things there was more gaps between their arms and their body and, and, and yeah opening and closing those things and just those that kind of thing caused it so that you could have this key that's great except for when they flap their arm with the chicken wing and you see the little green there and because it's got a certain kind of spill or because it's in this unlit weird area all of a sudden there's this weird hole that happens when they move their arm and it's like oh my god because i don't know how many times i've pulled a key and you're like man that looks money and then you play it in real time and you're like oh Wait. Yeah, Wait, there's weird. all sorts of noise that's dancing now because of it. And so that's really what I think comes down to the other part of it, other than lighting. Lighting is going to be the, if you have a, a dumb camera and not in a computer with no presets, you know, you have just a, a camera that has highly compressed footage. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, you know, a narrow color space. So you're, you're talking like uh, 420 or, or, or less. Um, and definitely your bit rate, so uh, your, or your bit rate, so 8-bit or something like that, that that quality, bit depth, bit depth, bit depth yeah. I'm sorry, and resolution, all these things play together to help with that. So the, the more bit uh, depth you have, the more colors you have, so more likely you're going to be able to pull that key because you can have the nuance and the gradient right. uh, be, uh, you know, there's actually a, uh, you know, a variance between two colors. There's actually 16 gradients between those two colors now when you have more colors. Um, color spaces, so there's not averaging of colors. So that's going to be, you know, if you're 420, 444, that kind of stuff is making it so there's uh, less uh, gener- uh, less colors being put together for the compression. Um, and so, you know, if, and in resolution, if you're shooting uh, in 4K to produce 1080 green screen, realize now you have the pixels are four times smaller so when you're doing you can do a finer key and it not look as um jagged and you have jaggies and i'm sure once you start doing this people know what the word jaggies (laughs) because it it looks like the word jaggies but it's just you know it's like when you um when you cut something out of photoshop and you have um i'm trying to think of what the the uh you're thinking of aliasing aliasing yeah so you have the anti-aliasing all over the edge you know where it's where it's squaring off well if the pixels are smaller, that squaring off isn't as apparent. Yeah, when you're do- using uh, high-resolution footage, you can start to see things like individual strands of hairs. Yeah. Um, and if you can see it with your naked eye, that means obviously the, the camera has picked it up, and, and hopefully the software can differentiate between hair and you know green background. But that gets harder, and it depends on hair color too, because yeah. like my blonder hairs are going to be more like pick up that green easier yep. oh, totally and of course also get get spill you know the darker the clothing the less spill because it's absorbing those colors and not reflecting it so if, if you're having someone wearing a white shirt you're going to get a lot more uh, uh spill it and this is something um everybody's local news i think is is guilty of this i even think in big markets but not as often as the key is not as good or you have a weatherman that doesn't know how to deal with a wall or he's wearing something strange so the first one is He's touching the wall. 
they touch the wall when they're pointing to things or whatever that interfering with the interfacing with the actual wall itself stupid not a good a good ploy because you're getting closer to the thing that's spilling on you so separation from can be with lights but also can be just with distance right so if you have a big enough yeah. green screen you can pull your subject away from the green screen not see the edges and that kind of yeah thing. and that's another factor besides lighting is is placement of your camera and your lights and your subject and your screen yeah, so if I was shooting a green screen of just a typical someone standing in front of a green, I would shoot at the highest resolution, the highest bit depth, uh, even highest bit rate, best color sampling, the less amount of compression you can so that you have more information when you're in the computer to pull that. But even if you don't have a fancy camera, you can still do green screen uh, by taking extra precautions, yeah, like well, so, separating your so, subject a good like 10 feet away from your screen. Yeah, like that would make it so you you're, you're having the best opportunity to have a really great key that's yeah. not saying you have to do any of that um i mean honestly i've pulled a good key out of a really bad lighting situation but what it takes is lots of masking and like okay um his shoulder is that green's not perfect there so what i'm going to do is i'm going to cut out just the shoulder key out just that green so that and make it so the shoulder doesn't have and then try to blend that back into the composition so and you hope the color doesn't blend i mean it's it, it gets really exponentially more difficult but the biggest thing is if you have a, a phone you're shooting on a phone small sensor you know probably as lightweight video footage as you possibly can if you light right you'll be able to pull a key really easily. You don't need special software. Yeah. You'll need the, whatever the editor is. Likely they'll have a king um, um, software editor and you don't need... I, it used to be one Chroma King was not included in editors, so you had to have a third-party keyer. Um, now a lot of them have been bought up by Adobe and, and the likes. So but, let's talk about what, what good lighting actually means. Like yeah. what, what is that, what is that uh, you know look like when you're picking out the lights and setting them up. So really what we're talking about is enough light on your subject, so your standard key and fill in front of your subject's face. Um, uh, enough light to evenly light the backdrop. So that's um, what you want to do. Here's a trick, by the way. Um, if you point your camera at the backdrop, the green screen, you light it. You want to probably put lights on either side, left and right, um, and maybe um, left and right on top and bottom if you have enough lights for it, but at least left and right. If you set your camera to show uh, zebras, um, and you show your cameras at zebras, oh, it doesn't really matter what it's at. You can set it at 100%, but I like 70%. And you can dial your exposure up and down and see where the zebras turn on. And those are your hot spots. Those are your hot spots. So if they all come on right away, like all at once, then you have a nice evenly lit screen. But if you do it slowly and you start to see the zebras up here in the center, and as you increase it, you know, the zebras are sort of spreading out from the center. That means you have a hot spot in the center. Or uh, also if you see them up here on the outside and they, as you increase your exposure, they sort of work their way in. That means you have your hot spots on the outside. I use that trick even today whenever I'm shooting. If I have a camera, if, the, if I have zebras, um, I, it's very, very helpful because the difference between um, 10 IRE, you know, just that in something we can see with our eyes, we can't see that, but the zebras will show it. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's right. going to be a really important thing to be able to see that stuff because you'll be like, oh, yeah, that looks money. And then you'll turn on the zebras, you're like, oh, maybe yeah. not. And that's, and, and that, the stuff you can't see with your eyes, those are the things that are going to be real apparent real quick once you try to pull that key. And right. I like to pull, I like to try to do a setup record and then try to pull the key then do it for real so yeah, like if you have i did time some, to do that that's a great way yeah, yeah so I mean, here's here's the last trick so the other thing you have to avoid is spill right so you shine all this light on your backdrop and now suddenly your backdrop is reflecting green on everything a lot of people think oh i'll just now shine some backlights on the back of my subject which you should do um but um but that can be somewhat unnatural like you might not want to have that really intense um you know, rim light around your subject or whatever, based on how you're trying to blend them in with the, the artificial background you're putting in. So, so the trick is to put a, uh, it's called a minus green gel on your backlight, and it's like a magenta gel. Mm -hmm. And all it does is, is um, it's the opposite side of the spectrum as the green, and you can dial it um, up just a little bit, and it just sort of washes out the green without giving you like this bright, um, you know, yeah. uh, blue or, or um, orangish light from uh, from a backlight. That's and, a good you joke. know, we've been talking about this because we have LEDs here in the state in in the studio, so we we very easily can dim our lights. But this is one of those things where dimming. 
uh, having a light that can dim is really yeah. helpful because if you just have full power, we're talking about backing off, moving your lights back, which can cause other unforeseen problems like shadows and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to pull up on the screen here and we're going to describe it uh, with our words because we actually have uh, a one of our uh, green screen, uh, how does green screen work uh, article is one of our most popular. If you just go to Google, type in green screen, we're like the third choice. Um, so if you want to get there, there. Or just search it on a site. Yeah, or just or go to our I site. Or I think it's in the top bar under lighting. There you go. Is it lighting? Okay. Or, or learn, know, then lighting. Yeah. Something. Learn. That might be not true. Lighting. Cinematography. Three-point lighting. Maybe. Maybe I'm thinking the three-point lighting article. Anyway. Well, three-point lighting is going to get you there. <laughs> you but can gonna, go I'm to gonna, the search box and type in green screen. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So I'm going to bring this up here uh, so the mic doesn't actually have to cut hey, it it worked. In. This yeah. is the first time we're doing this for like truly multimedia um a podcast where we're switching back and forth. This is great. So if you're listening to this, you can go to the YouTube video and see it, but we'll describe it uh, with our words as well. So there's two two uh, setups here, and this is something to pay attention to because shadows are going to be also the other issue you're going to have to deal with with your background. And the big problem is if there's shadows, it's a different shade of green, and the key is going to be different and more difficult. So here we just have, just with the placement of the lights for our subject, they're more wide, they're wider out. They're from... I'd say this is this okay. looks like more than 90, 45 degrees. Did you describe the first setup? So we have, what we're looking at is, <laughs> yeah, uh, is, is a graphic with two lighting setups. Yeah, one, one, the one on the left has the key and the fill directly next to the camera, directly one on either side of the camera, and it's a very narrow, two narrow beams of light at the, um, at the subject. And what this creates is shadows from those lights from the subject onto the background. Yeah, directly behind the subject. Onto the green screen. Onto the green screen, which is gonna be yeah. difficult. So just by moving the lights m further out, you can, or further away from the camera, uh, to the right and left of it, that you can now project those shadows on outside of the background area that is being captured by right. the field of view of the camera. So the shadows no no longer appear in the image. They're just outside of the image on the left and the right. And this is going to be really key to a lot of things, even lighting up the background. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of times when uh, flags are going to be really helpful. And by flag, I just mean something opaque that will block light from going to one another area. Yeah, it's usually a black piece of foam core board or something. Yeah, like which that. is important that it's black because if you use a white piece, it's going to start reflecting. Yeah, then exactly. it's a bounce board. <laughs> it is a bounce board. But either like depending on how far away from your subject or how much control you have of it, really putting anything in front of the light to block the light from going on to what you don't want it to go on. Um, and uh, that this is those are going to be really helpful for controlling all of your light in general. And a lot of times, it, here's actually a good question that I got on the last uh, green, green screen webinar. How do I do all this and uh, move the camera and the subject at the same time? Uh, mm. And then place them into a scene, and it's like, well, at that at that space, you're talking about, um, you know, sorry, uh, let's get back to us. At that point, we, uh, you know, you are dealing with a really complex thing. I mean, you just made it like a hundred times more complicated by moving your camera and your subject. So I'd say plan if you're new to green screen, at least don't start off with the Lord of the Rings green screen, start off with the news anchor green screen of yeah. static camera. You're placing someone into a, a scene. Um, hopefully you're not having them interact with the background you're placing in it. Like just pulling a key in the first place, that can be difficult, just that easy, simple setup. But if you do, like we said, lighting right, then you're going to more than anything else be able to pull that key easily um, and you won't need special tools or uh, special knowledge of compositions and, and, and or in, in compos compositing and whatnot and just lighting a moving subject with a moving camera like lighting that scene in general is going to be harder and now you're adding the factor of now you also have an evenly lit green screen that you have to maintain so well, it and, just compounds. And then when you put it into the scene, the scene has to move with it. The background has to move along with it. Just having a mat sit there and sat. So you, it, it really just really compounds the difficulty of the shot. So someone was asking how to do that. I think that's really great for that to be an aspiration. But that takes way more planning. And how a lot of motion pictures deal with that now is a pre-designed move that has been done in with the background wherever that's going to be. So say you're putting someone in, uh, you know, New Zealand or something like that, that that camera move was written down. Then they're using a robot to 
do the camera moves and everything is working in together. So when you key out, you just put two shots together and then they work together. Also, they often will put markers all over the green screen in the background, right? So that they can get uh, the relative position of the um, camera and the subject in the background together. Yeah, like those little like crash motion tracking dummy, trick. Uh, right, things, but right. really dots would work. Yeah, um, you know, it's just it's just something to be able to track. But you know, this is also one of those things where if you're shooting, you know, shallow depth of field or something, all of a sudden you're gonna be able to see those marks. Uh, it's more difficult. So there's there's a lot of difficulty in that idea. But we're talking about the most basic of green screens at this point, which is placing someone into a static scene to show that they are somewhere else that they're not. And then once you get how that works and like you know push a little bit the capabilities of your camera and your mat software uh you can figure out what's actually possible with the equipment that you have and you don't have yeah. like a, a motorized robot uh slider situation like yeah ju like just try to take the shot of someone walking down the street um you know with their green screen and you'll see how difficult that is yeah um, so just experiment and see what is actually possible for right. you and your setup and your gear and the other part of it is you need a huge green screen if you're an incredible on, lighting array yeah and you and yeah. if you're yeah. moving people and stuff it just the space becomes a really big issue with green screen and this is one of the things that i've noticed a lot doing green screen having a bigger room so you can get your subject away from the wall which is really the easiest way to control that spill. So now you're lighting your subject and your background completely separate from each other, and there's not a whole lot of spill from the background, is you start running into the edges of your green screen. And so you'll have a <laughs> limited space for that person to move around because you're going to have to mask out the corners or the edges of your scene to block out the edges of the green screen. So there is, um, I don't know if anyone has seen the, um, like the behind the scenes, um, you know documentary about um peter jackson's king kong it's quite good by the way if you ever get your hands on the uh, blu-ray blu copy and get access like to the it. criterion it's like, collection it's like four hours of behind the scenes stuff um but uh they were talking about their chroma king they use blue screen by the way we haven't talked about blue versus green um and the, the blue reason is blue tends to they use blue on film green is used on digital video um it just that shows up better. If someone's wearing something green, you'd but use a blue screen. In and this they, case, they were using yeah. blue, not only for that, but because th they needed to key out um, a scene in the jungle. Oh, green. And they had, they had their characters running through the jungle, which was, you know, plants and stuff, like real pr effects. They would crawl through the jungle, and behind the jungle was blue. And then they had to, you know, replace the blue with, you know, some sprawling mountainscape and sky and clouds and all that. But they had the same problem of, you know, that the shot was like handheld in a lot of cases and they would adjust the camera just a little bit and then be outside the green and they had to just rotoscope it, you yeah. know, jungle, like um, palm fronds or, or like ferns, you know, like, and I just remember this one line with the guy who's rotoscoping, rotoscoping, by the way, is frame by frame tracing every item um, so that, you know, you can just ma manually put the thing back there rather than selecting the color. So I'd get the shot, there would be blue in part of it, and then there'd be the edge of the screen, and then there'd be like a set with a light stand, you know? And so the guy comes in and he says, well, I'll tell you about my uh, normal routine here at work. Uh, I usually come in and I work on one shot. First thing <laughs> I do is I sit down at my desk, I load up the shot, and then I cry for about 10 minutes before starting work. Uh, Jeez. And so that's, yeah. that's what happens. Uh, I mean, you'll, you'll, uh, if you do any kind of moving shot with a green screen, you'll probably run into this, this issue of running out to the edge of the screen. I've run into it a number of times without even moving the camera. Yeah. Like someone is moving their arms or something and it goes outside. Um, but this is not, this is not a, a problem that's unique to low budget uh, video. Like Hollywood experiences it all the time too. Yeah, Though it's not uncommon to use a garbage mat like oh, yeah that's to right. a limit like yeah. if you're pulled back so far that you can see the edges of the screen you might as well garbage mat the outside of the screen right. part but it, just make sh the key is not letting your subject leave right. the green screen a garbage mat is basically a crop you're, this, you're basically like cropping out the uh, the outside and and this is something that um it, well if you've ever watched any let's play from uh, someone that's on screen so you're seeing them play very often, because they're usually medium shots, there'll be a time because that their body goes outside the framing area. Well, when you pull the green out, now all of a sudden we don't understand the frame, what the frame actually was, because right. there's no because it's just and, their head. And yeah, shoulders. so all of a sudden you'll just they'll put their arm out and it'll get cut off 
and there won't be any there won't be there and so you know that's that's one of those things where no matter where your subject's going into the scene and of course you want to light them so they look like they're in the scene we didn't talk about that as far as lighting goes but if you're right, that's, that's like a the that's level. the that's totally the next level is like i'm placing them in a cathedral why are they having high key light that doesn't make any sense right um high key light by the way is like sitcom style lighting that yeah. is like bright and even yeah exactly we talked about like match like the basic lighting where you need enough light on your subject and even light on your background. Uh, and we talked about matching camera moves, but yeah, matching lighting is just as important. And another um, reason to know what you're going to replace your yeah. background with ahead of your shoot. Yeah. Well, you know, so the thing is, is about a lot of this stuff is, is it, the key. Yeah. That's one thing, but then it's the blending them into the scene. That's really difficult yeah. uh, and making it feel like they were actually there. And this is around the reason why my, my argument of, of why I think green screens is the worst thing ever. Um, but, uh, I'm well, not talking about transition. Yet, but, but just that, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we really, um, I don't know where I was going with this. You interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> I just derailed it. Yeah, no, right. a, a lot spoke, of times I, I stick right in the spokes. Yeah, okay. I think that a lot of times you go into green screen and you're like, I'm going to green screen this and then I can do whatever I want with it, which is kind of what I said at the beginning. But if you go in with that mentality, then you have uh, missed an opportunity to light your subject appropriately. Oh, I know what I was talking getting to. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're totally right. And the, the big thing about it is, it's so much easier just to place someone in a scene if you lit them for the scene. And not only that, but sometimes you need less light. Like, you know, you're like, oh, I want to pull a good key. I'm just going to light everybody evenly so that it, I can fit it in there. But like, well, if you just need to make them dramatic, awesome. Now, now you have something even more contrasty to yeah. pull them from the background. So like, the, it's it's really nice to be your subject to be darker than your background anyway. And so that's that's definitely one of those things where you want to, I mean, it, lighting someone for the scene they're in is is really going to be the next the next level of quality in your your key. Like selling your composite at the end and not making it distracting. Of like, where's this person coming from that they don't match anything about their environment? Totally, just like all production, like. A minute done in pre-production is going to save you five minutes in post-production. Yeah, at least. So you know, well, I, what I used to do with this kind of stuff is, um, you know, during the shoot, I would have a computer there. I would take a shot, take the card out, put it in the computer, and and key it out just to see like how does how it, it how does it match, yeah. uh, and, I, and then adjust lights appropriately. Yeah, because uh, sometimes what happens is you bring it in and it's just like, oh, whoops. Well, the key light's on the wrong side. Um, so am I going to flip the, the person on screen or am I going to flip the background? background? Yeah. Right. And, and in some case, you don't have a choice. Like, you can't do either. It's like yeah. the person's wearing a shirt with text on it. And then the background's got a flag waving. Yeah. Or something, <laughs> or something or, like that, right? Or, no, that'd be reversed. That's yeah. another thing, not even having to do with lighting, but flags waving. Uh, okay, so you got to simulate wind in the green screen. Oh, right. And then is the person's hair blowing the same direction as the flag's blowing? Yeah. And is the light going in the right direction? And how much m like more difficult is your key going to be with their hair flapping around in yeah. the green screen? <laughs> yeah. Like that's a whole nother thing about like, uh, don't put fog in your scene, add that later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, you know, for green screen, you got to think in layers, foreground, background, you know, the, the those types of things are going to really help you in, oh, if I'm placing someone in a scene, then maybe you want to design something that's going to be in front of them so they can go behind it so it really sells that they're there. I mean, there's a lot of little tricks oh, that'll yeah. make it so that... George Lucas did that all the time in Star Wars. You'd yeah, have, like, some monster walk in front of the shot or something. Yeah, you'll have something, or just, like, they will go, you know, they step back and they go behind this lamp. Well, the lamp might not have been there in the scene, or you separate it from the background and put it in front of the... the so you put your subject within it. It's, it right, or I the always lamp thought is there, it was, but it's the only thing there. It, yeah, or it's a real thing, and you put it in the, in the green screen room with them so that you could actually sell this sp sp uh, sp space really that you're creating is those all those things if they all work together they're going to trick the eye to not pay attention to those other things that are telling them this ain't real so you know i mean i think that's the the big thing is like how many things can you do to distract the viewer to uh the problem that you're trying to get away from and I, I, i've had to deal with that just bad keys you know like okay I'm going to darken my background because I have to leave the green screen somewhat trans, uh, translucent so that the noise <laughs> stays there because otherwise some of their face goes away or something, you know, something like that. And it's like, okay, well, I guess it's going to be a little bit more moody of a scene because I need to get this done. I mean, I think with enough time, just about any key can be pulled, but we're talking about rotoscoping frame by frame for 
hours yeah. and hours, I mean, days upon days. That's fine for King days. Kong or Peter yeah. Jackson, or, you know, yeah. like. I mean, it's a great experience. I mean, you want to do it, try it, do it once, and then you'll realize where I stand. Um, that you want to go work in another industry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that you don't like crying before your work every day. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe we should uh, we should take a quick break, and we'll come back and basically argue about whether or not you should do green screen at all in the first place. Yeah. We'll be right back. For years, Video Maker has been producing quality video training to help you take your video skills to the next level. Now you can access it all with a Video Maker Plus account. We've got courses covering it all, from learning about how to navigate your camera with our course on camera controls and settings, to learning about color grading, or even how to start a video business, Video Maker Plus has something for you. The Video Maker Library's content is split into four levels. If you're just starting, try our inexpensive starter level membership, which gives you access to essential video training and a digital subscription to Video Maker Magazine. For the most professional training, go all the way up to our professional tier membership, which gives you access to our entire library of training and covers advanced concepts like running a video business or becoming a documentary filmmaker. Plus, the professional tier is the only membership with access to our popular webinar recordings. Get started today for as little as $1.67 a month. A buck sixty-seven. Sign up today at videomaker.com slash vm plus. That's videomaker.com slash vm plus. All right, we're back. So there is a, a controversy here at Video Maker about whether or not green screen should exist, I guess, right? Uh, <laughs> let me yeah. let me put it out there. So I, I mean, green screen's got its place, but so many times um, people are choosing green screen when they really should just be choosing shoot it real. Shoot, don't, don't try to put someone in a scene. Just go shoot it there. Now, I know you, we can't go to Mars, so obviously you want to shoot something on Mars, but I would say in that situation, try to find a, a beach or some place that, yeah. that that you can make it seem I, like you're there because the problem is... Beach? I, the I beach? Can't, or I can't, sell, I can't tell you how many uh, Twilight Zone episodes I've watched where they're supposed to be on a different planet, uh, but it's actually the, the desert outside of LA. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Well, yeah, I mean, that could be almost any movie right like they're yeah. supposed to be in italy and it's the desert outside of la like you know? m most things are the yeah. desert outside of la <laughs> <laughs> reno 911 it's not actually shot in reno it's shot in east la it reminds me of austin powers right wasn't there a thing where they're like driving around and they're like it's remarkable how much england looks like southern california yeah exactly <laughs> so many places look like the la basin yeah. uh but it, the big thing is is that so many people offer go well let's just green screen it and that's like unless you have a sound stage and that kind of stuff and I mean and all the backup to do it you know if you want to do a moving shot and you want to replace the background maybe just think of shooting it where you want it to be and it probably will be a lot easier and it'll look better in the in the end that's more of my thing is like green screen gets proposed way too quickly in the process sometimes when it's like can we just consider doing it real doing yeah. it for you know and and I see there's so many more practicals like I mean the um and it wasn't the Rise of Skywalker. It was uh, one of the other J.J. Abrams um, ones. But that they're doing a lot more practical stuff. They're doing sets. They're not doing all these green screens. And the films feel very different than the first three now, given it's because George Lucas is, doesn't really know what he's doing. He, he made a good story and messed it all up. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> but I think that green screen, you know, I mean, the ho putting the hobbits in Mordor, you can't, I mean, you can't really do that. But they shot a lot of it in New Zealand in these really crazy landscapes because they looked like it so they didn't have to do as much you know yeah. you're and not going to be able to get a well you might be able to make a dragon like jaws type of thing but that's a lot of work okay i'm going to put a cgi dragon in here yeah that's one thing but cgi and green screen aren't necessarily but like think about the expense of bringing the hundreds of people involved in the production of lord of the rings all to new zealand and putting them up there and having them be live there basically and i would go uh, that apparently was less expensive and, and time consuming than it would have been to to green screen all of the uh, landscape that they were in. They made a film industry in New Zealand because of those films. It's crazy. I would go even farther, though, and say if you're shooting a video for YouTube, think of the time and expense of building a set uh, and your ability to build a nice set and your ability to do green screen. So, like, for example, this set that we have back here, um, boy, it wasn't that expensive, a few hundred bucks maybe. Took a lot of time to set this up. Um, looks pretty good. We got nice lighting. Um, but we could have done it with green screen. We could, all three of us, have green screens behind us and chroma key it out. And it's possible that if um, if we just didn't have the skill or the money to build this set and we were pretty good at green screen, it might be good enough. Um, yeah. Especially if we're talking about non-fictional content 
um, where there is no fourth wall to break, essentially. Right. You're not trying to sell it. Like if you're putting a YouTube, a YouTube video up, you're not as likely to be trying to sell the effects and like trick your audience. It's more of an aesthetic choice at that point rather right. than like a storytelling choice. See, in my, in my, in, from my argument about that would just be, well, if it doesn't matter where you're at, then just shoot it somewhere pretty. Like yeah. then just go somewhere where the lighting is easy and well for way. you and, you know, uh, use shallow depth of field to give yourself negative space. If you need to put graphics or whatever you're doing, I, I feel like it's, it's like, it's a solution people offer to problems that aren't even close to green screen being the answer yet for them. If that makes sense, it's like you're take a couple steps back. Why do you even need to do that? Why do you want to put someone in a different place that they're not at right now? Why does that matter? Uh, you know, it, this, this, when I was at the TV station, so many times they're like, well, we'll, we'll key it. And then you'll put us uh, on the top of uh, the dam. Like we're doing a, uh, you know, a newscast from up at there. And I'm like, why don't we just go to the dam? It's 20 minutes from here uh, and shoot it. Or let's not act like you're anywhere anyway. And we'll just go out to this hedge out here. That looks pretty nice. And I will use shallow depth of field to make it so you don't really know where you're at. And voila, now no one knows what this back, the back lot of the TV station looks like. This could be anywhere USA. You know, the, it, we're, yeah, there's so a lot of solutions that you didn't need green screen to begin with. You didn't need to replace the background. There was no purpose other than you thought that was the solution to doing what you're trying to do. So that was maybe the question is then that should you avoid writing content that needs green screen in the first place, right? So like mm -hmm. if we're talking about the person who wants to do a green screen and because they're going to make a bunch of ads out of it, if they have this idea that I'm going to be on the beach in one of them and then I'm going to be at the top of a mountain and then I'm going to be in a busy city and we're going to shoot them all this afternoon. Well, you can't go to the beach and then go to the city and then go to the top of a mountain right away. Do you go at that point, that idea sucks, it's going to look bad, <laughs> let's not do it. Or do you go, well, it's going to be kind of silly, but that's I think the only will. way to do it. I think it depends on, on the tone that you're trying to take on, in, in a lot of cases too. If, if it's not a super serious ad and they just think it's funny to be on the beach and that's i don't know honestly i could justify that as being like okay this is kitschy like it's a little corny like it's fine though like that's what they're going for that i mean that's local ads i mean the local <laughs> ads run into having to do silly and that kind of stuff because it's the only way only vehicle for them to get it done and and be something that's not you know just uh them standing outside of their well store. Yeah. take that same example and apply it to progressive insurance right yeah um yeah in that case, do you say, okay, progressive, fork up. We got three locations across the country to go do this thing, and one is at the top of a mountain peak. Um, well, or you budget knowing that you're going to have to do that for green screen. Okay, and then you're doing it, but then you have so a budget. you just got to do it well. It. Yeah, I mean, the big, yeah. my bigger bigger argument is just it's, it's still um, – uh, well, this is a good example. We had a, someone wanted to talk outside of their store. But at the time, there was it was a, tra a high traffic time, so there was a lot of car noise, and we couldn't, you know, and they, we didn't think of ADR to to deal with it, um, and so he's like, well, let's come. Why don't we go to the studio? We'll shoot it on green screen, then you'll place me into it, like, or we can wait thirty five minutes till the traffic dies mm -hmm. down and just shoot it in front of your your place. Or he wasn't available that day. We really like the exterior picture you took. Uh, we just want to have have us in front of that. It just it's being proposed because people think it's this it's this high valuable thing. Where in essence, it's actually the opposite. Unless you pull it off well, and then no one's aware of it. You know, it's like one of those things where you're not. No one's patting you on the back, being like, "Hey, that's some great green screen." You hope they didn't yeah. notice it. You yeah. hope that it like really blended in. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. If someone points it out to you, you're like, well, then you noticed it was green screen. That's an issue of someone who is proposing it doesn't know that green screen is actually pretty difficult. Right, um, right. And, and you probably could do that thing that they suggested and do it well. Um, it would just be a, uh, way harder than just shooting them in the location. Well, yeah, I think, I think the problem here is not green screen itself, but unprepared green screen or using green screen to solve a problem uh, that either isn't actually a problem or that you should have anticipated at the writing stage or something like or that. Or that has a, several other better solutions. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing. It's like just seeing it as the end all when there's a lot of other things that could be, one, look better, uh, two, easier to do. And I don't think green screen, it's not its difficulty that keeps me away from it. It's just that so many times, even when you pull a good key, you do the lighting and stuff, it just 
it feels like green screen and it that's not a high valuable uh, production look it's a yeah. that's a low budget look that's a youtube look and that's fine uh you know but but it has to be intentional yeah it, but if you're doing you're that whatever, whatever whereas everybody's expectation is this big giant well you know the actors did this and it's like yeah well they had to interact with nothing so uh yeah. now you got to have someone that you know if you want someone to interplay with the actual scene itself they don't get to see this, so they're going to have to have a little bit better mind's eye with the with the scene and all the rest. But it's just more often than not, green screen is this is the solution for a problem that can be solved in so many more practical ways um, than using green screen. It just seems to be yeah, you know, people. It's this magic. I think that that's it's, a point that I wanted to get to too. Is I think green screen green screen is attractive because it's like the ultimate movie magic. It's like. I can do anything that I want because it's green screen. Um, and that mentality maybe isn't completely accurate, but I think that that's what people like, what attracts people to this concept of, uh, I can be flying through the air or I can, you know, whatever, have some crazy galaxy behind me. And, and, uh, and that's cool. And that's different than anything that they can achieve in their normal lives. So maybe that's like the appeal. Yeah. And those kinds of effects, um, anyone can do. I mean, well, anyone with some skill and not much equipment, you can do those effects with and, green and, screen. Yeah, and practice and, and correcting your mistakes when you get back to the edit and be like, okay, well, my my shadows were way too dark here, and now I need to remember to put another light here. And if if you're in a place where you can make those mistakes and then correct them and learn, and you're not like a professional who is trying to get the the commercial done this afternoon, then then that's a different scenario. Well, in I mean the production the production timeline of a local ad is very different than all other production in the way of that it's about getting this thing that can say something on so that people can see it fast, not about it being the best looking or the, all that kind of stuff. It's it's just about communicating something and getting people to actually hear it fast. So I think that, that this notion that green screen is often used unnecessarily to fix problems that um, where it's not a good solution, but also I think that, that the notion that green screen is a cheap effect and that it's clearly a cheap effect is not always true. Yeah. Um, and it probably is true when you are turning about a are talking about a, a quick turn type of production. Um, but green screen can be done um, quite effectively and quite convincingly um, by, or, you know, outside of Hollywood. Um, it's just really difficult. It's um, diffi and take, yeah. it takes a lot of learning, a lot of practice to, to get it right. You know, and, the and planning. I think you can't just go into it on the sh day of the shoot and be like, okay, today's green screen day. You have to like do the tests and prepare your actors for what they're going to have to do and like have your, you know, know how to light it and, know it's going to look good and i like the idea of testing it right away so that you're not wasting your time yeah like so pulling the key if you can here's a, an application i think that green screen you can't really beat it is you um want to make it so that they're driving in a different neighborhood so you're doing a you know kind of a side profile of someone driving a car um put green screen outside it you're replacing the world outside of it or whatever yeah, obviously it's going to have to be moving or whatever. Maybe we talk about a, a scene in a kitchen and it's looking out the window, so things aren't actually moving. But they're but you don't have the whole background's not being yeah, replaced. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You're replacing just the what is being seen through that window. So just the windows there, and then there's a green screen that's yep. lit nicely behind it, yeah. or whatever it is. If it's, um, I mean, I think a great uh, situation is as a mirror, so that a person can interact with the mirror in a uh, really crazy way, you know, oh, or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, uh, like, like Donnie Darko, like you're, you're going all of a sudden you interface with it and it turns into water or, you or know, just the mirror is you, but you're frowning and yeah, you're, you're doing yeah. Smiling exactly. It's an alternative mirror, reality like, yeah. or whatever. Those are great ways that like you, that's how you can get in that other world. And I thought like Mike was talking about, like if you can't, if you know, if, if it's doing something you can't do like flying, yeah. there's going to have to be some of that, but maybe it's that you shoot up and you put green screen on the thing you're laying on so you can get rid of it, but that yeah. you're not replacing the whole background. Those are great uses of green screen that aren't that's typical greens all over everything. Yeah. Or, you yeah, know, yeah. I think there's a difference in the d situations that you're describing and like the typical like green screen setup where uh, on lower budget productions or, or whatever, it's like a subject in front of a green screen and nothing else. Whereas the example we talked about from King Kong or these other examples with the kitchen window, it's like, there's a lot of real elements in the scene, and then there's a little bit of green screen to help you out. Yeah, and and you know, and, and those those are places where um, 
what, what was it? Uh, well, it, I'm seeing it actually the next step now, which is instead of green screen, they're actually just because TV monitors are relatively cheap. It's just projecting what you want into those. So um, mm. I, w I'm trying to think of the production, but it was a full um, cockpit of an airplane and they wanted the um, people in it to it, for it to feel like what they're doing because they had a bunch of people in there. And so they had like footage of like the plane going down and smoke coming from the from the wings and all this kind of stuff. But it was real, you know, monitors just it was outside there for the actor. to yeah. see. Which it was just outside the portal of green screen. Yeah. Instead of putting green screen in all the windows and then replacing and it or like, whatever. Your plane's on fire and act yeah. like that. And, and given if you have a good enough actor, they're not going to need that. Or hopefully you don't need that. And that seems like a high expense or whatever. But this yeah. was just trying to show the technology of these monitors or these screens of you could do something like this for and it was a relatively cheap cost. It was more about this piece of hardware that could replicate the same thing or make project. Uh, one big scene and split it up in a real unique way. But so the other situation we really haven't talked about is situations where green screen um, doesn't. It, I mean, it's a necessity and it doesn't have to be that good and it's going to be fine. So the example that you gave of the, um, the you know the the um, person who's reading the weather in front of the green screen, like reaching back and touching the screen, and their shadow comes, and you can kind of see the green come through yeah. a little bit. That's an, another example of. This is non-fictional work. There's no fourth wall to break. Everyone who's watching, I think mostly, understands <laughs> that that person's in front of a green screen. And oftentimes these weather uh, people do silly stuff with it anyways. Like on Halloween, they do the thing where oh, I'm a floating head. Right, yeah, you know. point it out. So it doesn't have to be great. Obviously, it's, 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 um, obviously it's better if it is good. But if it's bad, it, you're not really ruining anyone's experience. Another example of this might be the uh, the game streamer on Twitch yeah. who has maybe the jaggies around their their picture or, or their, their they lean back and they stretch yeah. you know and, and their arm is clipped out that's okay no one really cares um, yeah. it's kind of the fun of it anyway yeah I think, I think it's, it's uh, if, if anything it's funny and uh, people are so hyper aware of how online video is created. I think that it's it's just like, oh, I noticed a cool behind the scenes thing. You're not doing fiction. What, what's it going to be yeah. about? Yeah. Uh, I have a good story about um, the weatherman behind the scenes stuff. So we were making a promo for the TV station and we had a new uh, general manager. So I didn't really know his feelings on promos and that kind of thing. We shot one and it was a behind the scenes shot of a weatherman on a weather wall, you know, pointing to the wall. He says, why didn't you key that? And it's a behind the scenes. There's cameras. You can see the rest of the set. Why, yeah. do, I need, why don't you put something in there instead of that? I didn't, I'm like, I don't really understand what they would be standing in front of. And they, he's like, we'll put the weather in there. But it's like <laughs> a handheld shot of behind the scenes of stuff. And I, I mean, I did it because it was a new manager. I was like, okay. And, but and the then, weather, the weather graphics don't like wrap with the, the green as it hits the ground. Yeah, well, right? I mean, we, I put, I, we, I mean, we've spent a good amount of time because I didn't know how, you know, I was like, you got bad taste, man. This is maybe you're not the right guy but anyhow <laughs> uh, like, and well and we did it and then he got it i mean i got it immediately when he said the idea that it was stupid but that he had to see it to know it was stupid like, oh this doesn't yeah. make sense and like That's good i mean we realized yeah well, i mean what, what we we're going for originally yeah. yeah i mean what would have been smarter is just to do it down and dirty and be like see so he can understand the difference instead we spent a lot of time lighting the scene and making it so that we could actually pull a key and trying to put something in there and that's where i found the if you're moving you're yeah, gonna, it's hard. yeah, and luckily for us, it was a four-second shot, so we did all this kind of stuff. And he was like, That's, "Do motion tracking and all." Oh that. yeah, oh yeah, we got mocha for that. <laughs> for that. Yeah, well, then you had mocha. So yeah, yeah, good. exactly. We got it was like uh, mocha at the time was like a hundred bucks or something like that. I was like, "Oh, we got that." Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just like well, you want that and justify buying me something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just one of those things where some people are offering green screen as a special ma magic fix, but it's super strong and like I love it for the idea of removing something. So you have a scene that you don't like, you know, or you don't, you want to be able to take something out. You want to replace it with something else, or you're making, you know, guy fly in the air and you don't want to get rid of the cherries laying on or whatever, those kinds of things. That's a great, great use of, of, of green screen, you know, um, definitely, you know, it can be used in just really creative ways. Uh, but the, just the idea of I'm going to put someone, uh, well, the first time I ever came across green screen was watching Wayne's World. <laughs> oh, and yes. They, they're, you know, they're doing this thing, and then all of a sudden they're like, we're in Delaware. Oh, yeah, and it changed like right behind him. Yeah, and it's like yeah. a postcard that's behind him or whatever. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we're in... And it, it, it just pointed out the like how cheesy this idea of teleporting someone like, oh, I'm 
I just <laughs> well, and, and given Mike Myers and they're very good at pointing out those like stupid things in production but but that I think that was playing on this idea that amateurs in video like to use all the tools right away right yeah. like give me the star they, they flipped the green screen back and forth they did the um, you know the what do they call it the the like this big zoom in and out no, extreme close up it's like yeah that's right what? and like I remember when I got my first camera that had a fully manual zoom ring where you could turn it as fast as you wanted to use it all the time that's like you, you know when you get into your first close. editing software you're using all the transitions mm -hmm. and I yeah. think that was the story of Wayne's World is these these guys who are amateurs and they're they're playing with all the toys and yeah. I actually think it's good. Like, I think you should do that. Yeah. People will be like, uh, don't use the star wipe. But like, you got to know what it looks like and if it, uh, how it works and why it doesn't work oftentimes. And same with green screen. I think you have to do it and, and learn if it suits what you're trying to do or not. They, uh, they use the heart wipe at the TV station on one day on Valentine's Day, always to show the staff blowing a kiss with the, uh, with the heart and you know the different okay. background but it was like okay that's you know it, you just you accept that it's this cheesy thing and you go with it and yeah. I mean I, the Wayne's World is another good example they built a set of his basement you know what I mean it's like so yeah. it looked like he was still in his basement and I imagine the whole time it was the set anyway but the, they showed the behind the scenes of it actually being a set instead of a guy's basement and that's <laughs> the thing they could have just green screened that and, you know, that sounds like a, a producer with a, a, a small budget. It's like, oh, green screen is cheaper than building the set. Let's just green screen it. And it's like, well, you can. It probably won't look as good. It won't uh, look as good and you'll be limited because then there's no set to move around. If yeah. You yeah. Remember when that. Tom Hanks was on there with his band? Like, how do you do that with the green screen there in the space? Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, a anyhow, it's I, th I think it's one of those it, green screen. I, I hate to poo-poo on it because it does have its place. But it, it too often we're trying to use it just because it's this magical thing that you can replace things that and exists. It, that exists. Yeah, it, <laughs> and it, it it is very quickly able to change the you know if you don't have the opportunity to shoot somewhere strange you can be on the moon. You know it's yeah. it, it's Either not you difficult. you have this experience where you watch a movie and uh, there's green screen in it, but you don't really think about it and you're kind of immersed into it. And then you watch that movie again, like four or five years later, and it's like this looks like crap. You know, oh, I can man. see all the lines. Totally. And That's yeah. very often. I mean, all well, that used to be CGI too, right? Yeah, it's it reminded me of, uh, like they Jurassic Park hand. hit the fir perfect like uh, like you the CGI like all the stuff blends really well. But most things like you watch the first Star Wars uh, Phantom Menace. Jurassic Park used a lot of practicals. Pra yeah, they did a lot of practicals, but like Phantom Menace, I watched it in IMAX when the second one came out, so they re-released it, and it was like, I can see the the cells yeah. of the art that you drew, you know, and the, this is when, you know, instead of doing CGI, you're actually, make, you know, uh, animating something or whatever, and it was like the green screen looked so bad because it was blown up so large, and just <laughs> so much of that stuff just didn't play out well when you got a under a microscope, and I've, that's, you know, watching, I mean, green screen in SD, sign me up, because there's so few pixels to get rid of anyway. I think that there's a, <laughs> this is a psychological thing more than a, than a technical thing, so I don't know if, so we've all experienced that, where you watch a movie like years later, and you see the you You're see like, how crappy it looks. Sucks, yeah. <laughs> but tell me if you've experienced this. You go to the movie theater and you watch a movie and you're totally immersed and then you watch it again on Netflix like four months later and then it looks like crap. You know, like there hasn't been that much technological advancements. And the difference there is yeah. the first time you watch it, it's all new and you're immersed in this other world. And the second time you're watching it, you're a little bit more distant and you're watching it as a movie that's appearing on a screen and then you see things. Yeah, and yeah. I think that what happens is um, a lot of times when you see green screen effects, even if it's good, but you can actually see the green screen and you're like, oh, that's just green screen. It's, it's not necessarily because the green screen was done poorly. It's just because for whatever reason, you're just not totally drawn into that story. You're not in that world. Yeah, I think that it, the theater specifically is made to be immersive, an immersive environment, like you're in a darkened room and all you can look at is the screen. So that in itself is more immersive on top of the fact that you've probably never seen it before. So you're paying more attention to the story than the technique. And then when you go home, there's all these distractions and you're not as immersed in the story and the story is not fresh anyway. So you have time to analyze all this other stuff. And some of what you're going to be analyzing are the effects. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I think the other part of it is the warning that they give you at the beginning of your DVD. This was not made for this. This you know wasn't made for this situation. It was made for a oh, theater, yeah. right? So when they re-outputted it, so it fits in your sixteen by nine TV screen, they didn't care as much. They well, we're going to sell these seven dollars at a time instead of the movie ticket. I spelled, spent twelve dollars, and Our really, person. yeah, we're we're making we we made our billions on the theatrical release. Someone the distributor now is making the money on the getting out the the you know Netflix is making more money on it than someone else you know what have you but i think a lot of times it's it's that they didn't they don't there's so many things to design for when you get outside of that uh the theater you know it's like i know the size of the screen we know what we're delivering they you know they have expectations and all sorts of formats and stuff whereas you have those standards for discs and whatnot but i don't know what the <laughs> quality of their tv is i don't know if it's going to be bright enough or too dark yeah. i don't know the the situation in the room so you know i think you know of course that immersive thing totally has to do with it but i think a lot of times it's also that you know people are watching on their phone and sometimes that's great sometimes they're watching on a tv i think of my own production it's like i look on on a on a phone and I'm like yeah this looks money and then I put it through my TV you know at home and I'm like oh this doesn't look as good and it's like oh because the my TV's 4K the stream is HD and this was never designed for you know, yeah. it was being delivered in a situation that it was really well, thought of and TVs have all these weird dumb settings like our TV, uh, every TV comes with motion smoothing turned on by default, which oh, you have yeah. to go yeah, and that's find a, that's and a turn off. They really had a- yeah, and so it looks bad because of that, because it looks like a soap opera all of a sudden. And then, like, my TV does this weird thing where it's, like, ambient light detection, but it just ends up making the screen, like, dim and get brighter at random. And I find that so annoying. And yeah. it's not anything to do with the video that I'm watching or the movie that I'm watching. It's, like my tv's fault and so many people have so many different tv brands or ages you know or whatever, when, people, so. when you're making something for a certain screen uh, as the artist of that content you want to have the control to give it to them as you intended and that's why so many filmmakers love the theatrical release because they do typically have that control whereas yeah, they know at, what it will look like. whereas at home yeah there's all sorts of things in consumer tvs i mean as a audio engineer i i hate that there's graphic EQs and uh, nose noise profiles <laughs> to make it so you have heavier bass and stuff. And it's like, I didn't intend this to have heavier bass. But they want it. Yeah, no, what but the that, hell? Like, that all ties back to like unpredictable green screen results in general and like effects results in general and just all your color work is kind of... Just images in Who general. knows? Yeah, who yeah. knows what it will look like when exactly. someone watches it on their grandma's television set. So um, we should probably wrap it up, but maybe that's a good topic to just end uh, with a question for listeners on i guess right so the question is um this phenomena of watching um something for the second time and noticing all its flaws only in the second time have you ever experienced this when you, the two times that you've watched it the first and the second time were on the same screen hmm. so uh, you saw a movie in the theater twice you didn't notice the green screen until the second time or you watched a movie first on your tv at home and the second time on the same screen, you didn't notice the flaws until the second time. Um, and uh, that would tell us if there's a psychological impact here, I guess, right? <laughs> this is hardly a scientific test. but yeah. I I'm think curious. Th- uh, yeah. I'm, so experiences. I'm curious on the other side. Who's seen a movie at home first and then got to see it in the theater? That's a weird order. That's a weird uh, order. That is, yeah, and that is weird. You can sometimes, I mean, uh, the local little independent theater here has like a repertoire or repertory. Uh, what, what is that what I it think is? It's repertoire. Or repository. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> repository. They, they have, <laughs> it's like a whole series where you can go and watch classic uh, films. So that is possible. Yeah, there's, that I mean, sounds weird. Or like they, they <laughs> usually, like if you have a bigger city, there's like the the third string movie theater that's running stuff that was from a year and a half ago that's yeah. $2 to get in and you yeah. can buy beer and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I Second think I like theaters. may have seen the Goonies that way. Like I saw Goonies on, you know, VHS and, and TV and then, you know, one of the local... Um, uh, movie theater started to run it at, at midnight show. Oh, mi- yeah, yeah, midnight movie. I've totally, I've done that now. A yeah. classic I've seen at home and then I watched it in the theater. But I think it was, I then was like, oh, I get to see this in theater. Or like uh, when, uh, you know, something goes on film and actually goes, does a run, like it's actually the film. So you can actually yeah. go and see the the film version of it, which yeah. it seems pretty yeah. exciting, especially on something that was shot on film in the first place. So let us know your feedback on this uh, in your iTunes review. 
uh, if you want to give us one, uh, <laughs> yeah. your five star review, right? Right? If you, no. Uh, yeah, actually, that would be great. But uh, feel free to leave a review or a uh, comment wherever you happen to be um, consuming this podcast. Um, we would love to hear hear your thoughts on this topic, um, and as well as green screen in general. We have um, a variety of opinions here today, so um, it'd be great to hear uh, listener feedback. Green screen sucks. Green screen <laughs> is appropriate a lot of the time. Uh, yes, I agree with Mike. <laughs> nice. Okay, we'll call it there for the t- today. Thanks everyone for listening uh, or watching, and we'll see you all next time. Ta-ta. See ya. Thanks everyone for listening. Again, if you like the podcast, we'd love to read your five-star review over on iTunes. iTunes reviews are a big help for new podcasts like ours. So if you would leave us a five-star review and subscribe, we would be very much grateful. For Nicole Lajeunesse, Chris Monlux, and everyone here at Video Maker, I'm Mike Wilhelm, and you've been listening to the Video Maker Podcast. We'll catch you next time.